The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Welcome to this episode of Reasonably Speaking. I am pleased to welcome our three guests today who will be discussing their experiences as Supreme Court advocates. On this episode, I have the privilege of joining the audience as Doug Laycock generously accepted my invitation for him to lead this discussion. Doug is a law professor at UVA and University of Texas at Austin Law Schools. He is perhaps the nation's leading authority on the law of religious liberty and also on the law of remedies. He has testified frequently before Congress and has argued many cases in the courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, where he has served as lead counsel in six cases. We are also joined by Nicole Saharsky, now a partner at Mayor Brown, where she is co-head of the firm Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. Nicole previously served for 10 years as an assistant to the Solicitor General. She has argued more cases in the U.S. Supreme Court than any other woman in the last decade. Finally, I'd like to welcome Seth Waxman co-chair of the Appellate and Supreme Court Litigation Practice at Wilmer Hale. Seth served as Solicitor General of the United States from 1997 through January 2001. His practice spans both federal and state trial and appellate courts. He has delivered 80 oral arguments in the United States Supreme Court and many more in the lower federal and state courts. The first voice you'll hear is Doug Laycock. Well, today we're going to try to talk about the Supreme Court as an institution from the perspective of two lawyers who appear there all the time and occasionally get some other work done. Um, you know, w- one way in which arguing the Supreme Court is very different from any other court is that other courts are bound by the Supreme Court's precedents. And the Supreme Court really isn't bound. It can overrule when it chooses. It can distinguish disingenuously, and there's no one to call them on it except the dissent. Um, A lot of folks on the political right are expecting a whole lot of overrulings. We'll see if that happens. Um, We get cert petitions these days where the question presented is, should this particular case be overruled? At least that's clear cut. It's fuzzier when one side is clearly hoping for a big change, but they never quite say so. And you've got all these precedents you can rely on, but you know that none of them are really reliable. So how do you deal with that as an advocate? Seth Waxman, we'll start with you. As an advocate, you have a view about whether it's necessary in order to uh, either preserve a a victory that your client achieved below or to challenge one, whether it is or isn't necessary or advisable from an advocacy point of view to ask the Supreme Court to reconsider one of its precedents. I I argued a case last week in which the question presented was, whether the court should overrule its prior ruling in a case called Nevada versus Hall, which is a 40-year-old interstate sovereign immunity case. There was no uh, beating around the bush. Um, The only way we could get relief was to ask that it be overruled. Um, There are other instances in which you may be trying either to defend a decision below or or overrule a decision below that doesn't necessarily forthrightly require, doesn't necessarily require that a decision below be overruled. All all advocates in the Supreme Court and in lower courts are skilled in being able to distinguish adverse precedents. Um, And uh, I would say that when it is possible to achieve the result that you think the court should deliver without asking the Supreme Court to overrule one of its precedents, it is virtually always good practice to do so because the court is institutionally disinclined to overrule prior decisions, whether they were right or wrong. Nicole Saharsky, what would you like to add? I mean, that's my starting point, too. You've got a client. You want to win. How are you going to do it? You know, the, the 
I think conventional wisdom over the past decade is that if you can have a narrow rule that you know can get the Supreme Court on your side without requiring them to do the big step of overruling precedent, you press the narrow rule. But like Seth said, there are some cases where you can't. And I think like you hunt, hinted, Doug, you know, the, the right thing to do in those circumstances is to be forthright. If what you want is for the court to take on some of its existing precedent, to put it in the question presented, or at least make it a secondary question presented, so that, that that's what they know, you know you're asking for. I think the circumstances where the court perhaps gets frustrated is where you really want the court to overrule its precedent, but you're not willing to say so. And I think there, you know, that that leads to some questions and whether there needs to be supplemental briefing and what you really want. And I don't think the court likes being confused. So if you need it and you're clear about it and it's in your client's interest, then you do it. If you don't, you know, you try to go the narrower route. When I argued City of Bernie before, as there were 29 citations to the dissent in the city's brief. And I thought that was a good sign for us, right? Uh, no, the dissenters had the votes and uh, no one asked for anything to be overruled and everyone pretended that nothing had been overruled. But um, but, that, but that, that's another way to do it, argue your case out of, out of dissents. Um, what about other differences between arguing the Supreme Court and the well, Courts of Appeals? Well, there's a whole host of them. Um, Nicole, you want to go first and I'll just pick up sure, I mean, the I'll many start. you don't mention. The thing that I like about the Supreme Court, and I actually think it's true about, you know, anywhere you're arguing an appeal, is that the Supreme Court really expects you to make sense of the rule that you want them to adopt and to explain it, not just in terms of precedent, but from first principles, whether it's the Constitution or federal statutes, and to explain why it's a good result that would lead to justice in the world. And I do think that's an approach that folks should take everywhere, but certainly, you know, when I work on cases in the, the lower courts, you often see briefs that are just precedent, 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 and never explain why something is a good rule or the rule that would have, you know, good outcomes for the public at large. And the Supreme Court demands that. You know, they really will always focus on that, will always ask questions like that. And I think it's it's important to know that going in that that has to be I mean, an obvious difference is that the Supreme Court sits on bonk, does everything on bonk, which is to say the nine, all nine justices are participating in every decision about what case to review, what questions to review, and how to decide cases. And that creates a remarkably different dynamic for advocates and for the justices than exists on um, the federal courts of appeals and even state supreme courts that sometimes sit in panels. Um, and I, it, it creates a much different dynamic in terms of briefing and oral argument, period. The other thing that's very significantly different is that since the justices have control over their docket and um, really have been accepting for merits review a decli significantly declining number of cases to the point that even on the few days that they sit, they often can't schedule two cases to be argued. And they have a multitude of law clerks. When you show up for oral argument, you can be highly confident that the justices are very familiar with everything that's in the briefs whatever is relevant in the record. It doesn't mean that they're, several of them aren't mistaken about things that they confidently assert, um, but that's very different in the, in the courts of appeals. It is very often the case that the courts of appeals that have huge dockets, the judges show up oftentimes not terribly well prepared. And you know they've got a caseload that doesn't allow them to spend the amount of time either in in preparation or uh, for the argument or in preparation of their opinions. And eight of the justices are very active questioners. They talk more than you do. Uh, and you got to get your answers out very quick because you're not going to get a third sentence. I mean, what I tell young lawyers is don't plan on, in terms of planning your preparation for oral argument, don't plan on trying to figure out what the answer, the best answer is for any question that might come up. Because if you hesitate, hmm. um, you're likely to be interrupted by another question. Right. right, right. So you tell them to try to anticipate all the questions before they get there? The SG's office, I think, trains you to pretty well anticipate the questions. I mean, I don't know your experience, Seth, but in the SG's office, if you go through two moot courts, you know, the chances that the court will ask a question, some justice will ask a question that you haven't gotten to one of the moot courts, just like vanishingly small. I mean, in the 10 years I was there, there were probably 
three or four questions that a justice asked that you know someone didn't ask in a moot court. I don't know. Well, so I, must be similar I've, to your experience. I've now argued over 80 cases, and I've only two times that I can recall had a question that I hadn't ever really even thought of. They were both asked by Justice Stevens. Um, and they, it was just, I, my, my reaction was, I can't believe this. I never thought of that. Right. Um, now, one of them, one of them was involved the, the constitutionality of a uh, rule that the EPA had announced uh, for ambient air quality indexes, and it, it depended on um, an eight-hour average for various ambient um, uh, elements in the air. And this is at the end of a very long oral argument, and Justice Stevens, has, as he always used to do, would say, you know, may I ask a question, which is always a signal Normal. that you're about to be, you're about to be skewered. And he said, well, may I ask a question? And I said, of, of course. And he said, you know, this, this eight-hour index, which eight hours is it that they're measuring? And I said, I don't understand you. And he said, well, is it like 8 a.m. to 4 p.m.? And I, I looked at him and I said, Justice Stevens, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> I can remember one time that I got a question that I was not, I just didn't know the answer, and Justice Ginsburg asked it. It was about whether something in a criminal case, whether there was guidance in the U.S. Attorney's Manual on it. So, you know, maybe someone would have anticipated that question. I didn't. But I think, you know, what, I, what we were taught in the SG's office is that you say, like, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you some other close related thing. Right. It's kind of, it's, it's good when it happens, because at least from my perspective, the scariest thing in, about arguing in the Supreme Court is thinking that you have to know the answer to everything that might come up, right? And so having, there, having a question come up, and then you don't know the answer, and then it's fine, it's yeah, I would say in that regard, you, you know, arguing fear. for the United States as opposed to arguing for a private party does sometimes, I mean, the court does expect a higher level of preparation. They expect definitive answers on government policy and government positions. Um, and it hasn't happened to me, but I've seen it happen to some assistants um, where the justices will say, you know, what is the government's position on such and such a thing? And the lawyer for the United States doesn't know. Um, and, you know, when William Rehnquist was the chief justice, uh, he, was, he was just very offended at the notion that some lawyer, some human being representing the United States couldn't provide a definitive answer on U.S. government policy about something that wasn't actually directly at issue in the case. It's very fun to represent the United States, but it is interesting when you walk into court and they believe, the justices believe that you should have all of the relevant knowledge from the government of the United States in one person's head and ready to explain it to them. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, there's a lot of talk about polarization at the court, and the Chief Justice says there are no Obama judges and Trump judges. Um, <clears throat> Trump, the press says we don't believe that. There are obviously Obama judges and Trump judges. Uh, are they as polarized as the press likes to claim? Uh, and does it cover the whole range of cases or just some of the well, hot button culture um, cases? The answer to the latter question is certainly it doesn't cover the whole range of cases. Um, the court, you know, just issued a decision this week in a criminal case, I'm forgetting the name of it, that involved whether something was or wasn't a violent crime for uh, various sentencing purposes. And, you know, I think Justice Thomas wrote an opinion for himself and Justice Ginsburg and somebody else, and Justice Breyer wrote an opinion on the other side for the Chief Justice and Justice Alito. I mean, um, there are... I mean, one way to look at that case is one justice from each group flipped, yeah, but the it, other you know, seven it, were it, lined up just the look, way there you are, expect. There are, issue, there are recurring issues before the court as to which the you know, long sitting members of the court views are very well known. When I was Solicitor General, the court was a couple, became Solicitor General, the court was a couple of years into, um, you know, what is often referred to as the federalism revolution, which resulted in a whole line of cases upholding the sovereign immunity and sovereign prerogatives of the states of the union vis-a-vis 
federal law and federal court orders and things of that nature. And, you know, I, I argued, you know, three sovereign immunity cases in, over the space of a month in 1999. And, you know, objectively speaking, the handwriting was pretty pretty much on the wall because in the previous sovereign immunity cases, they'd all been decided against the United States by a five to four vote. I actually believed sincerely that whatever the next case I was arguing was the case that was gonna put a halt to this because there had to be a limit. But it wasn't as if going into the arguments, there was any illusions about where the justices you know, inclinations were. And, and when you're talking about issues, and you can, you can call, some of them are hot button issues, but some aren't. Anybody who is gonna competently represent their client, whether it's the United States or a private citizen in the Supreme Court of the United States has to figure out, how do I get to five? Which is the only number that really matters in the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure both Nicole and I have lots of stories of, uh, you know, instances in which the strategy to get to five worked and the strategy to get to five fell one vote short. I guess I don't think that they're as polarized as the media, the justices are, are as polarized as the media suggests, because, you know, like Seth said, a lot of the where the justices shake out are issue dependent, especially in criminal cases. You get some just very interesting lineups on, on both sides. And, you know, you I think they, they get this view or they, there's a sense that they're polarized because of where they come out on the hot button cases. And those do seem to divide more between, I guess, what you would call the liberal and conservative justices. But I don't think it affects the majority of what they do. And I don't think they want to be thought of that way. And, you know, another way that I think about it is, you know, we think of it as the Supreme Court. Wow, it's, you know, so amazing. But, you know, for them, it's a workplace and they're all going to work together for decades and they don't want to be at each other's throats. You know, they like to get along and be friends and because these are the people you see every day. And I think if you think of it that way, like, sure, they all have views and some are strong views and some are less strong. And it just depends on how they're going to come out in a particular I mean, this case. is certainly, I mean, on, 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 on a variety of issues, there is a sharp division um, among the justices as to how the Constitution should be interpreted or the meaning of certain legal doctrines. I don't think that this is necessarily a novel period. If you think of, you know, the New Deal legislation after Franklin Roosevelt was elected, you know, the Supreme Court of then under Charles Evans Hughes was uh, overruling, was, was striking down on constitutional grounds, the Agricultural Adjustment Act and any number of other really important pieces of legislation. The court was unbelievably divided and that is what produced the, you know, the proverbial switch in nine that saved, switch in time that saved nine. But, um, you know, the court has done things over the course of its history in high profile cases that have given some credence to the notion that the justices act politically. I mean, Bush versus Gore is, was just such a grievous wound for the court, um, which signaled it at the outset by saying that, you know, it wasn't, it didn't want to see its decision in that case ever cited as precedent. Um, but by and large, it pretty much, pretty much hasn't been. It's a bad sign at the outset, though. Right. Normally, you don't say that about something you're super saying confident. It's always been in. political. Right. At least I mean, there, 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 are, there are definitely <laughs> issues. Look, I mean, at the time, in, in the lineup of cases, in the long run-up of cases that ultimately produced Brown versus Board of Education, there was institutional reluctance to mess around with Plessy versus Ferguson. Going to the, the first topic you, you raised, Doug, I mean, the, the way that that enough momentum got built up for Brown versus Board of Education is that there was a very carefully thought out progression of suits brought by Thurgood Marshall on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that chipped away marginally by marginally at the predicate, the premise of Plessy versus Ferguson. And, but even so, taking the step in Brown versus Board of Education was a huge, huge step. And I dare say that two years before Brown was decided, the justices in their conference would have found themselves 
sharply, sharply divided. It's a function of the Chief Justice, who has a special responsibility to preserve the institutional integrity of the court, to try to work the court's docket and work the decision-making process in a way that avoids that. And I would say that I think John Roberts is very, very cognizant of the need to do that at this moment in history, when the whole country is so polarized on almost everything. Yeah, and you know, as long as, as long as presidents and the Senate are polarized, um, it will be, they'll appoint justices who tend to be sharply on one side or the other. They tend to perpetuate polarization at the court, and the court handles it better or worse. And, and clearly the court does not want to be perceived as highly polarized, but the, the hot button culture war cases get a lot more public attention than the business cases and the interpretation of the aggravated crimes right. act. Or the, the, um, the warp and woof of ERISA preemption doctrine. Yes. So what happens if large chunks of the public come to view the court, um, view the justices as just political agents for the president or the ideological movement that appointed them? Does, does that disrupt the court's function? Can they deal with that, Nicole? I think they'd be really unhappy about that. I think the chief, you know, much for the reasons that, that um, Seth just said, does not want the court to be viewed that way and wants, you know, respect for the court's institutional role. And I tend to think that there will always be some of that because even when you have justices who are appointed by certain president, presidents, you know, they're there for the long haul, those justices. And sometimes they don't turn out exactly the way that the president expected, et cetera. And, you know, they have some time to figure out how what kind of rules they're going to put in place, et cetera. But, you know, from the chief's perspective, I think we've seen pretty good evidence this year in terms of not wanting to enter the fray on a lot of hot button political issues. You know, the court has had a lot of opportunities to take on cases that it's turned down. Actually, somewhat interesting, there was a, a dispute, a couple of disputes involving Planned Parenthood where I was representing Planned Parenthood that met all of the traditional criteria for cert. We, of course, were trying to get it denied and cert got denied and Justice Thomas wrote a dissent from denial of cert that said the only reason the court isn't taking these cases is because they're too political, which, wow, I was surprised he said that, but I had a sense that that was true, that this was a particularly tough year for the court and that the chief thought that it would be better for the court to proceed more incrementally and perhaps with some more ERISA and whatever other bankruptcy and other cases and not take on any of that hot button stuff. So it's really the role of the chief to try to to try to keep things moving smoothly. There's some cases I haven't denied, but they seem to be trying to string them out so they won't be heard until next year instead of this year. I'm thinking of the, the three cases on whether um, the employment discrimination law and the Education discrimination law covers sexual orientation under yeah, the rubric I, I, of you sex. know I I tend to think look the well, the one thing about the Supreme Court managing its, its docket is um, it can be pretty confident that any important question that's raised if it's really important is going to be raised in another case. I don't necessarily I don't place as much credence as other many others do about the court's current reluctance to take hot button cases. I mean, they, 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 they've taken three gerrymandering cases, which is a hot button issue nationally, not only jurisprudentially. When they, when they took the Wisconsin case last year um, and ultimately didn't decide the issue in any sort of clearly signposted way, they didn't have to take the Maryland, North Carolina, and Virginia cases, um, you know, this term. They, you know, they took the, and we'll hear later this month, the oral argument in a federal district judge's authority to order discovery beyond the administrative record in the census diversity, the citizenship question, which, you know, is other, was otherwise proceeding to trial. I don't think there was a great need for the Supreme Court to grant cert on the merits of that question this term. So I don't think that they're necessarily shying away from it, but you know, in order to get cert to get cert granted in a case, you need four votes and ordinarily the four who are voting are looking pretty carefully to make sure that there will be a fifth to agree with them, except in cases in which the court just has to take it. There is you know, that there are, on the exact same question, we've got six courts of appeals that have said the answer is yes, and five courts of appeals have said the answer is no. 
to a degree that if you presented the same facts in different jurisdictions, you would get a different answer on a question of federal law. And when an issue has gotten to that level of dissension within the country, you'll get four votes to take it, even without confidence that whatever side you think should win will win. But it's often quite discretionary. I mean, it's that, and that's especially true on business cases. I mean, those where you have real circuit splits that affect people's lives. I mean, that's why the court takes ERISA cases is because there are businesses that operate nationwide and they need to know how to run their employee benefits plans and they can do it one way in five circuits, but not in six circuits. You know, they, they just need an answer. They probably don't even like the ERISA cases. Would be my well, I don't guess, know. They take I don't them. know. They're, they take enough of them. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the justices like them, the clerks don't. That, 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 that's a possibility. Um, <clears throat> so, do you have views on all the hype about the chief being the new swing vote? Is there anything to that? I don't think he wants to be thought of that way. I mean, I, I think the reason that people say that is because they're thinking that Justice Kennedy voted certain ways on certain issues, and so that if they're looking who is the fifth vote we could get, like Seth said, we need to get to five, you know, maybe he is in play. And I can understand why people might be looking for his vote on certain issues, because he often proceeds incrementally and, you know, would, might be willing to have a narrower ruling as opposed to a broader ruling, and so might be on, you know, one side in a particular case. But, you know, in the same way that Justice Kennedy didn't like this idea that he was a swing vote because he didn't swing, you know, he would say he didn't, he wasn't the one swinging, it was the, I don't know if it was the court or the issues. I'm sure the chief would not want people to think that he was swinging Yeah, and, and I forth. think, I mean, the, the, the whole notion of a justice who is the swing vote really oversimplifies things because, you know, you can say, well, you know, everybody thought of Anthony Kennedy as the swing vote, whether it was he was swinging or the other justices were swinging. But um, you know, on I could I could list you a dozen issues on which Anthony Kennedy wasn't close to yeah. the fifth vote. I mean, on state sovereignty and the First Amendment, he was an absolutist. Right. Um, and you know, I think the same will be true of the chief. And I mean, there are a couple of justices on the court who you would think, you know, except in a truly extraordinarily rare case, are not going to be the fifth vote. Um, but I wouldn't put the chief in that group. There are probably some legal issues for which he will provide the fifth vote one way or another, but many in which he won't. Yeah, and to your point about Justice Kennedy, he wasn't a swing vote on gay rights either. He was a solid vote for gay rights. He wrote all the important opinions. People thought of him as a swing vote because he was voting against the other conservatives on that issue. But on that so issue, I'll give you he a, didn't here's swing. a concrete he example of sort of an interesting sort of who's my fifth vote, who's the swing vote going to be. I argued a case about 10 years ago called Roper versus Simmons, which asked the question whether it violated the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution for a state to order the execution of a juvenile offender. Um, in that case, the Mr. Simmons was 17 years old at the time he committed the murders that he committed. Um, and uh, at the time, the Supreme Court, I think 11 or 12 years earlier, had held that it did not violate the Eighth Amendment to execute a 15-year-old offender. Um, so the court had already decided the question of whether the Eighth Amendment constrained the states in executing a teenager. Um, and all of the justice, every single one of the justices who had joined the Supreme Court since that decision had separately written their views on that in concurring opinions or denials from cert petitions. So there was perfect information. Um, and there were five expressed views for the fact that the execution of a juvenile did not violate the Eighth Amendment. And so the challenge as the person hired to take the case into the Supreme Court was, I need to come up with a convincing rationale. I need to persuade at least one justice that that earlier decision, Thompson versus Oklahoma, um, was incorrectly decided because it was predicated on imperfect information. And, you know, 
I thought the only gettable justices in the case at the time would be Sandra Day O'Connor or Anthony Kennedy because of opinions that they'd written in somewhat analogously relevant cases and you know argued the case that there there has been there had been a huge development in scientific knowledge about how the juvenile brain develops and 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 had you know, some amicus support for all of this information that shows that the frontal cortex develops late, particularly in young men. And Anthony Kennedy provided the fifth vote in what was a five to four decision in the case. I guess I thought of him as a potential swing vote because I thought he might be, he might take cognizance of this kind of new information that really refuted a predicate of the prior decision. And so he ended up being the swing vote. Um, but, I mean, that's, that's, a, that, that, that's an answer to the question of like, what do you do if you know that the votes are stacked against you and who is the swing? I mean, you know, in any case, there's no good advocate who's not thinking about how do I get five votes and Sometimes there are areas of the law where you just have no idea. This is an area of the law that the court has never considered before. I've argued cases where, honestly, going into the oral argument, I couldn't predict the vote of a single justice, um, which is not to say you don't try to get the votes of all of them. And there are others where you can predict all nine and you're trying to flip one or flip two. We've been talking about political polarization at the court. There's a very different criticism that you sometimes hear, is that the justices no longer have broad political experience. You know, if you look back to the mid 20th century, we used to see governors of major states, United States senators, cabinet officers, political advisors of the president, people like that being appointed to the court. And it just doesn't happen anymore. Um, Justice Kagan, I think, is the only justice appointed since the 70s. Uh, who was not first an appellate judge on some other court. Um, Kagan, Breyer, Ginsburg, Kennedy, Scalia had all been law professors at one point, uh, some of them for much of their career. Uh, justice O'Connor was the last justice to have served in a legislature, and you got to go back a good ways before her to find the next to last. Um, Justice Pryor, I, Breyer, I think, understands how legislature works. He was six years counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, and some of the others have done a variety of interesting things before becoming an appellate judge. Justice Ginsburg was the Thurgood Marshal of the women's movement. Um, Justice Kavanaugh worked in the White House. Uh, and, and, and there are others, but no governors, no senators, no long political careers anymore. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, or is it just a thing? Does it not matter much? I guess I think it's more just a thing. I mean, I tend to think that diversity of experience for the court is good. Not that there needs to necessarily be just that there need to be justices with political experience, but you know, having someone who was Solicitor General, for example, in Justice Kagan is good because that's someone who you know saw a lot when she was working uh, in that capacity and understands where the government's coming from, et cetera. The Chief Justice also had worked in the Solicitor General's office, has that kind of government experience. Having experience on the courts of appeals is great too because you understand what role you know those courts are playing, and you're a little closer to see what the district courts are doing. And I think that helps when they're when they're reviewing you know what the court of appeal what the courts of appeals are doing and what the district courts are doing. But, you know, I'd say that about almost anything. I think having geographic diversity is good. I think having diversity in their backgrounds and their law schools, et cetera, is good, you know, just so that the more that they can represent, you know, an, a, a legally educated cross-section of the population, the better. Justice Scalia said they had four of the five boroughs in New York for <laughs> geographic I'm from diversity. from the Midwest, so that doesn't seem like a lot of diversity. I mean, I think, uh, look, the most important thing is to have very smart people who are human beings um, and have an appropriate humility about the fact that they happen to have had the fortune to be appointed rather than this was their, the destiny of the universe. Um, all of the things being equal, I think the court and its processes would benefit from having experience, a broad base of, a much broader base of experience than the justices have. There are I think the only justices on the Supreme Court who have any experience as trial lawyers are Ruth Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor. In both cases, it's pretty limited. Um, 
there are no justices on the Supreme Court who's ever, so far as I can recall, had a criminal defense practice of any sort, white collar or blue collar. There's, I think there's, Thurgood Marshall was the last one, and, and there's, he's been gone there, for a long time. Uh, you know, there, as you pointed out, there's nobody who served in a state legislature, nobody who served in state government. Um, it's, it's a pretty limited experiential pool there, and I think that I think the court would benefit all of the things being equal from having greater experience. You know, it's interesting that, that the same was true for many, many decades for the office of the, the person who was the solicitor general. I mean, the, the early solicitors general were actually trial lawyers um, in their, you know, in their history. But when I became solicitor general, it, would, it had been like 40 years since anybody had been uh, been appointed solicitor general who wasn't either a law school dean or a court of appeals judge. And <laughs> there was this, there's a tradition, I don't know if it still exists, but at the time I was told that it was traditional for the new solicitor general to pay a courtesy call on the chief justice. Um, yes. Okay, yes, and so I, you know, my assistant called the chief justice assistant and asked if he would be interested in a courtesy call, and he was. And I went over just before the first Monday in October for my courtesy call, and he was incredibly courteous. And he said, you know, well, you know, just my colleagues and I, you know, you know, we, we remember your advocacy from the previous year when I'd been serving as deputy, but, you know, we really don't know anything about you. Tell, tell, tell us, tell me something about who you are. And I said, well, you know, Mr. Chief Justice, I think the easiest thing to tell you is that what I'm not I've never been a law school professor or dean, and I've never been a court of appeals judge. And Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist leaned over, says, leaned over and said, may I say on behalf of my colleagues, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think was a comment on qualifications to be a justice, but I think was reflecting a desire perhaps on the part of some justices to have the government's principal advocate be somebody who actually was an advocate. Um, rather than the tenth justice. You know, another part of the institutional way in which the court functions is the lawyers who appear before it. And in the last, I'm not quite sure when this started, but the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen the development of a highly specialized Supreme Court bar. You guys are both part of it. It's centered in the big DC law firms. Um, and it argues an ever increasing percentage of the of the court's cases. Supreme Court specialists all know each other, is my impression. The justices all know you. Um, what forces are driving that development, and is is it a good thing or a bad thing? Or I think it's more recent thing? than thirty years. Um, it's it's a function of a number of different things. One of which is the court's docket has been shrinking, so there are far fewer cases for oral argument. Another phenomenon which absolutely did not exist when I first started practicing law, and really when I became Solicitor General, was this um, phenomenon of large law firms basically needing for some business reason to establish that they have a Supreme Court and appellate practice even though most, very few Supreme Court and appellate practices actually make money um, uh, for law firms. And, um, and also, I think, a, a not infrequently expressed desire by justices to preference for advocates who know how they go about thinking about issues, how they go about deciding issues, and what they expect in terms of written and oral advocacy. I mean, look, we just we live in an age of specialization, period. You can't call any old plumber anymore to take care of some specialized plumbing problem. And I, for one, think all of this is, is not a good development. I have viewed myself as a generalist from the day I started practicing law. And I think being a generalist, not just a Supreme Court lawyer or an appellate lawyer, but you know a trial lawyer as well, helps 
advocacy. It helps bring sort of experience and breadth to any legal question. But, um, and I still think that the best Supreme Court argument I ever delivered was the first one where I was appointed by the court to represent a double murderer. Um, there, there are, I tell people there are three kinds of lawyers that appear in front of the Supreme Court. There are the lawyers who are arguing like their first or second case. The justices don't know anything about them. They have no preconceptions and they come to the advocacy, the written and oral advocacy with an open mind. Is this somebody who is going to answer questions with wisdom rather than some clever quip? Is this somebody whose representations about what is or isn't in the record is reliable or not? It's a blank slate and you can write your own reputation. The second group are repeat performers in the Supreme Court who the justices respect um, and trust as, as oral advocates. And then, I'm sorry to say, there is also a group of lawyers who appear frequently in the Supreme Court who the justices are less confident of. And when I say to clients, you know, or potential clients, like, who should I hire as a lawyer? I said, you just don't want anybody in group number three. You don't want the lawyer who's saying, oh, I'm a Supreme Court expert. But in fact, that person's track record in the Supreme Court has generated some pretty manifest skepticism on the part of one or more justices. I guess the only thing I have to add is I feel like sometimes there's a misconception about the Supreme Court bar that, you know, the Supreme Court bar is this elite thing and it's basically this group of lawyers that think they're better than everyone else. And, you know, from my perspective, it's just like when you spend only when you spend five or 10 or however many years focusing, especially if you're in the SG's office on this one particular court, you get really good at knowing what that court's going to do and what kind of arguments to make and whatever else. And so when I talk to folks about, you know, who it makes, who should be doing their Supreme Court case from our firm, et cetera. You know, the reason that you would want me or Seth or someone like that that we know, it's not because we just think we're better overall. It's because we think that, like, we have a specialized skill that the Supreme Court wants to hear and, you know, wants to hear from and and get that kind of get advice from and see those kind of briefs, et cetera. I mean, I don't go to trial courts. I'm not anywhere near as much of a generalist as Seth, but I don't go to trial courts and say, I'm great. I'll do your trial. You know, I, I know that I don't have those skills. And so, you know, at least when I talk to folks about, you know, at what stages of the case I can provide value, you know, I think that there is that specialization and that's a place that I can add value. And arguing the Supreme Court is it's not a, a different better skill. skill. It's a and, different skill. you know, I have to say the quality of the the quality and preparedness of lawyers who argue in front of the Supreme Court today is markedly better than it was decades ago. When I was uh, Solicitor General, I uh, collaborated with uh, Jeff Sutton, who was then Solicitor General of Ohio and is now a judge on the Sixth Circuit, to create an advocacy institute for state AGs, lawyers who were going to be arguing for the states. And we set up a program um, where I and others in the Solicitor General's office came and led seminars for them, and we organized moot courts for them. And, and the lawyers who argue for the states now are very good, and they've been mooted very well. Um, the big lacuna in the, quote, Supreme Court bar, that is, the lawyers who argue in front of the Supreme Court, and several justices have commented on, on this publicly, is the criminal defense bar. Um, and it is a great disservice to the court. It makes it hard for a court of nine justices, none of whom have ever been tried criminal cases, represented, you know, somebody accused of a crime, to sort of fully appreciate the, the potential force of the advocacy on the other side. It's not clear how to solve this systemically. I and, and many other People I know, you know, do training sessions for public defenders and et cetera, et cetera. Tony Amsterdam at NYU has run a program for capital lawyers, capital defense lawyers for many, many years. But um, if there's an advantage to the Supreme Court, a market advantage to the Supreme Court bar, it's reflected in the disparity of advocacy in criminal cases. What we need is an SG's office on the federal public defender side. That would make it more fair. Yes, although many of the people who are arguing are, you know, they're like state prosecutors, right. or state, state, state defenders. Defenders. Yeah. yeah, that's right.
Seth, I want to subdivide one of your categories about <clears throat> the lawyers appear before the court. You know, I've I've been involved either for parties or Miki in most of the religious liberty cases of the last 25 years, but I'm not in any sense a Supreme Court specialist. I'm a subject matter specialist. And so when I get into a case, I start generally with a deep knowledge of the law in that area, and that enables me to do a Supreme Court brief while still tending to my day job as a law professor. Um, but you guys argue all kinds of cases in the Supreme Court. You know, you defend, you defend capital murderers, you try to get California out of pain for its torts, you do ERISA cases, you do this and you do that. There must be times when you start out knowing very little about the relevant law in the case, and, and, and yet you crank out a great Supreme Court brief and, and an argument. How, how does that work? How do you go from zero to 60, Nicole? Well, I, I like that. I like being a generalist because I think to a significant extent, the justices are generalists. And so if you can learn it and explain it to someone that, you know, if I can learn it and explain it to myself, then I can explain it to them. And that makes me feel a lot more confident about it. And I think actually the, the processes and being a member of the SG's office helps a lot with that, because in the SG's office, everyone is so busy that you often have a pretty limited amount of time to, to learn something even entirely new. I'm sure Seth has stories of some of the stuff he's had to learn. But I had one case, for example, that was about uh, gerrymandering and voting rights, a claim of race discrimination in voting. And I did not have any background in voting rights for various, and I had not briefed the case for various reasons. I was going, the, the person who was going to argue it. And so, but because I had been through this before in the SG's office, I figured like, this is what I need to do. I need to read the briefs and I need to make sure that I understand what we're arguing and I need to ask whatever dumb questions I have about it. And I got the, fo the person from the Civil Rights Division who was the expert on the issue to come to my office for two hours. I might've had some cookies or something. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I'm gonna ask you some really dumb Dumb questions, and it might worry you that the Supreme Court argument is in less than two weeks. But I will get through it, and if you just, you know, humor me and stick with me, like we'll talk it through. We're going to start at this high level, and then we're going to work our way into the details. And if you have confidence, I think in that process, it's fine. You know, it's hard when you first start out, but after you've been through it a few times, you know, you I realize mean, for you can me, start the, more generally. I think the thing that specifics. has kept me quite happy in in a litigation practice, both in the government and out of the government, for over 40 years now is the fact that it allows me to sort of equally divide my time between learning and teaching. Um, I love the fact that I'm not an expert in any particular area of the law or any particular area of human endeavor. And I, I love the fact that I, you know, will get hired to take on cases in areas I know absolutely nothing about. I mean, when I was Solicitor General, there were a whole bunch of challenges raised to this Omnibus Telecommunications Act of 1996. And they were all consolidated in a series of cases that came to the court. And it was, this is clearly very important and something that the Solicitor General would have to participate, you know, argue himself. And before we started briefing the cases, I called over to the Federal Communications Commission and had them send over asked if I could spend a day with the chief technology officer. And I sat in the conference room with um, the people on my staff who were gonna help write the brief. And I said, you know, I just need to understand a lot about how telecommunications works. And I really appreciate your coming over here. And, you know, this person said, you know, very happy to help. This is very important. We have to establish, you they know, make- say yes to the SP. Yes. And so I said, listen, this is gonna scare, this is gonna be scary, but I just, I know it's not one of the legal issues in this case. But can you just tell me, like, when I pick up the phone and, like, dial a number, how does it know where to go? And when the other person on the, when I say, the other person picks up and I say hello, they know who I am based on how my voice sounds. I mean, how does that mechanically work? And the process sort of builds up from that. And, um, you know, when, when doing patent cases involving biotechnology or things, I do the same thing. And um, when I started becoming more of an appellate lawyer rather than a trial lawyer, I started out before Supreme Court arguments trying to explain the case to one of my kids. Hmm. Um, uh, How old were they then? Um, ranging in age, but, you know, let's say 10 to 12 to 14 years old. And when you try to explain something to somebody who's not a lawyer and not a sub, you know, a technical expert, you realize that 
you know, no matter how simple you're trying to make it, there's built into what you're saying all sorts of assumptions about what the other person must know. And the discipline of trying to explain a legal position in the context of facts to a teenager or, you know, any non-lawyer is a tremendous learning experience. And it's not as if the justices of the Supreme Court are children, you know, and that they don't, under, but, but you can never presume that they will understand the predicate to whatever statement you're going to make. And that's why, you know, even in an area as specialized as patent law, which I now, you know, now comprises probably a third of my practice, you know, you figure the federal circuit, this is a specialized court, the judges are all patent experts. First of all, they're not. And second of all, they're not necessarily expert in the various technologies. And I do feel like, as Nicole said earlier, being a generalist, explaining things to a generalist is helpful, and I think is helpful to judges. Um, I'll just tell one, really, one other really funny story. When I I became uh, the Deputy Solicitor General. It was a year in which Walter Dellinger, who's a mutual friend of all of ours, was serving as the acting Solicitor General. And the office of the Solicitor General was uniformly horrified at this thing because between the two of us, we'd argued two cases in the Supreme Court and neither of us was an appellate lawyer. Walter had been a law professor his entire career and I was a trial lawyer. And didn't he also ride his bike down the DOJ? So yeah, all all sorts of things. Yeah, okay. Anyway, the two of us were, were there every, every day of the week, including on the weekends. And after a couple of months, Walter came into my office, you know, in his socks, and he said, you know, this job is just so different. He said, you know, in my prior life, when I would, like, have to write something about a subject, you know, first I'd have my research assistants sort of collect the relevant stuff and I'd read the cases and I'd talk with my colleagues about it. And then I'd maybe teach a course, like a one semester course. And as I started to collect my thoughts, I'd have, I'd, I'd have a symposium or a workshop on the subject. And then I'd do a draft and have another workshop where people could talk about this. And then I would publish it. He said, now, you know, we have to file like hundreds of briefs every year. You know, th this is just like a fire hydrant, and, and it's so different. And I said, well, Walter, I feel like it's so different, too, because I used to be a trial lawyer, and <laughs> I, I feel like the fact that I have several days to work on a brief or to prepare for an oral argument is like an eternity. We're about out of time. Let's shift gears a little bit. What's your favorite story from a Supreme Court argument? Well, so this is, this is more of a sad story than a happy story, but it's probably my favorite. So I had this case, it was a criminal case called Mathis, and it, it had to do with a very specific issue about criminal sentencing. But it basically came down to a prior decision that Justice Kagan had written for the court and whether it should be interpreted one way or another way. It was basically like you were going to interpret it A or like B. And I said to Michael Dreeben, who was a criminal deputy the night before, I'm like, what do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be A or B? If it's A, we win. If it's B, we're like really bad, right? And he's like, I don't know. You know, good luck. See what happens. And so I had 30 minutes and I got up and uh, we had about five minutes full of questions and the justices were just asking little softball questions. And I explained my various reasons why the answer was A. And it, they were based on, you know, various things that the court had said in the opinion and common sense and prior cases and everything else. And then Justice Kagan, she just can't help herself. You know, she looks at me and she's like, well, you know, I wrote that opinion for the court and I'm pretty sure it's B. Hmm. And so I look at the clock and there are like 25 minutes left. And I had friends visiting, too, from law school who wanted to see me do an argument in the Supreme Court. So that's really great that this all happens. And so she says, well, I think, you know, I think it's B. And I'm like, no, you know, we really think that it has to be A to be consistent with these prior cases and everything else. I said, she's like, no, I think it's B. And she would give some other reason. And so really the whole remaining 25 minutes was just me giving another reason why we thought it was A. And then she gave another reason why she thought it was B. And the other justices 
just kind of watched it like, this is kind of fun, you know? Like, they, I mean, they didn't really care, I think, about this issue. And so finally it was over with. I actually thought at one point that the clock was broken because I thought that like well more than 30 minutes had gone by. And for some reason I thought I should look over at Michael Dreben, my boss, and like try to somehow tell him that the clock was broken. I don't know why. And I look over at him and he's like looking away. Like he doesn't know what I'm, who I am or like why I'm saying it's A. You know, like he takes no responsibility for this whole thing. So finally the argument ends and I go to lunch and I try to put it out of my mind. But then of course that day there's this like Supreme Court bar reception, the Supreme Court Institute ones that they have over at Georgetown. And Justice Kagan often comes to these things. So she comes up to me in a group of SG's office people and says, pretty fun day for us, wasn't it? I'm like, no, <laughs> it was not. I don't know what to say to that. And so that was probably like the most recent, just very memorable argument. I mean, now it's kind of funny, but at the time, like I know I was only up there for 30 minutes. I mean, I have like a lot of memories from having argued cases in the Supreme Court, but I guess probably none is more poignant than my very first argument. I mentioned earlier, I was just appointed out of the blue. I wasn't, I only argued a couple of appellate cases to, to uh, represent a convicted double murderer in a case in which the Eighth Circuit had reversed his conviction on the grounds that his confession was involuntary and had been obtained in violation of his Miranda rights. And the question presented was whether um, a claim of a Miranda violation having been fully and fairly litigated in state post-conviction proceedings was one that a federal habeas court could take cognizance of. The court had uh, a couple of years earlier decided a case called Stone versus Powell that said that Fourth Amendment claims could not be heard in federal habeas corpus if there was a full and fair opportunity to litigate the case in state court. And this was a case that was, you know, the, the state had successfully petitioned in order to have this rule extended to the Miranda violations. And uh, my opponent, I'd never only been in the Supreme Court a few times before. And the United States in the form of, in the person of John Roberts was arguing as an amicus alongside the state. In fact, in the well of the court was the first time that John and I ever met each other. And um, I had, you know, studied and studied and studied and I'd done moot courts on this really interesting question about whether, you know, Miranda is or isn't a rule of the Constitution as opposed to some prophylactic rule. And I get up and I start my argument and um, Warren Berger was presiding and, uh, you know, I, I give my little like 30 second pitch and Justice Scalia sa interrupts and says, Mr. Waxman, um, you know, you've said A and B, but I, I, you're just wrong because, you know, C and D. And I looked at him and I'm like, I, wow, I finally got a question, so I, I'm not nervous anymore. Um, and I said to him, Justice Scalia, it's with great trepidation that I want to suggest, I want to explain that the premise of your assertion is unfounded and therefore your conclusion is invalid. And he leaned back, God bless him, and said, oh, go on, Mr. Waxman, let me have it. And everybody in the courtroom started laughing. And I said, well, okay, you've said this about this, and that's just not wrong. Your decisions in these three cases establish that that's not true. And therefore, you know, you're, you're, I think your question is somewhat misguided. And he then came back and said, well, you know, how do you reconcile our, you know, your position with our decision in, I don't know, Quarles versus New York or something like that? And I said to him, and the whole time, Justice White, I didn't realize this was his practice, but he very often didn't look at the advocate. He swiveled his chair and he was staring at the side of Justice Blackman's head. And I thought, wow, I need Byron White's vote here. Um, you know, and he's not even looking at me. And Justice Scalia said, how do you, how do you answer you know, the, your, your argument with X, Y, and Z case? And I said to him, Justice Scalia, I have read all 38 of your precedential post-Miranda decisions on application of the Miranda law. And every time I try to 
reconcile them in my head, I feel like my head is just a bowl of spaghetti. And Justice White wheels his chair around and leans over and glowers at me and says, how do you think we feel? <laughs> and it was at that moment I thought, look, I don't know how I can ever get another Supreme Court argument at the case, but this is like the most fun thing I have ever done professionally. That's a good note to end on. Thank you both. It is fun to argue up there. It's scary for the people who love you and are watching you, but once you get into the swing of it, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Thank you both. Thank you for tuning in to Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Kristen Evans. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo and I'm Sean Kellum. 